10 piece oh, chicken McNugget. Stop, 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 stop. My thing stopped. Give me a second here. It's always Glenn. It's always Glenn. No, no, no. I moved Glenn, my thing. Cause give me a second I, here. I, I kind of thought that Chris was picking on you a little bit, but man, the tides are turning. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, man. These guys pick on me all the time. Hello, my friends. Thank you for joining us for the PebCAC podcast the information security show featuring some all-around good people it is week 42 of 2022 i'm chris louis and my wallet is hurting from the amazon prime early access sale no brian this week he is spending much deserved time off with his family right before the recording he sent us a selfie in the group chat of him with his razor utv on steroids thing so we wish him well and that he returns to the show next week with no broken bones who we do have on this week is Glenn Medina, who still did not find a pool Roomba during the Prime Day sale. Glenn, where are you broadcasting from this week? Hey, everyone. Uh, broadcasting from Houston, Texas. Uh, two things. I hate you, Deech, for not being on here. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, we should have been on vacation with you uh, on that razor. And then the uh, second piece is I actually found the Roomba I actually ended up just buying the Roomba, Chris, the pool Roomba, gosh, about a month, month and a half ago, because uh, I just couldn't wait for the sale. And guess what? It still wasn't on sale this past uh, the, the other day. So, yeah. So you have a clean pool and the joke's on Jeff Bezos. That's right. Well, no, not really Jeff Bezos, because I ended up paying full price for the damn thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you helped pay for part of that Blue Origin rocket then. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Our guest this week is Arif Sajid. Arif is the SE who interviewed with me and researched my background to inspire me to restart the PebCAC SE book project. We're thrilled you joined the company and here as a guest on the podcast. Arif, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, guys, thank you for uh, having me on. Um as you mentioned, my name is Arv Sajid. I'm coincidentally, uh, Glenn, I'm also uh, based out of Houston, Texas, so I didn't expect that. Yeah, exactly. Who would have thought? Um, but yeah, I uh, recently joined Zscaler as a commercial SE. Prior to that, I come from uh, a large uh, energy company. Uh, I started in the SCADA world, spent a couple of years there learning about you know, PLCs and RTUs, HMIs, things like that, really um, dove deep into the OT world of things. And then I transitioned over to the cybersecurity team and I was involved in like security operations and incident response. Um, really, I de describe it as being down in the trenches, putting out fires. Uh, and then, yeah, that's really uh, what my background was up until now. Now I'm on the other side of the aisle on the on the vendor aspect on the sales side of things. Well, dude, now that you're in Houston, let's go to the Cyber One Chili Cook-Off here. That's what I'm here for. So let's go meet over there and have a couple beers and some chili. Yeah, for sure. That I just I totally was not expecting that at all. And then you said yeah. Houston. I was like, huh? <laughs> Where's my invite? I want some beer and chili. There you go. I got some beer and chili for you, Chris. <laughs> not Wendy's chili. <laughs> that doesn't count. Well, great to have you on, Arf. Combined, we have decades of information security experience and here not just to educate, but to entertain. We've got four awesome stories for you this week. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. In closing the loop this week, as a follow-up to our story about the protests in Iran, some hacktivists hacked into the Iranian state-owned TV to play a message to the Iranian people with a picture of their supreme leader with a crosshair on his forehead and a message for Iranians to rise up. So apparently that revolution is still going on. We wish them well and keep up the hacktivism. How cool is that? That was thinking awesome. Loved it. Go go Iranian. Go women in Iranian. So yeah, that's definitely awesome. Love to see that kind of stuff. On the topic of high school reunions, Last week, I got tagged in a picture on Facebook by someone I went to high school with and haven't spoken to them since then. I knew it was a hack, but October being Cybersecurity Awareness Month, I took it as an opportunity to educate him or her about enabling multi-factor authentication to prevent things like account takeover. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. 
don't 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 you have a policy that before someone can tag you it has to be approved by you or do you let anyone tag you chris in facebook so I haven't used Facebook in so long. I didn't even know that feature existed. <laughs> so that's good to know. That's good yeah. to know. I should yeah. just disable it altogether, actually. That's probably be the better step. Yeah, after I got tagged a couple of times, I was like, what is going on? I don't want to get tagged. So I made it a, I guess there's a there's a privacy policy that says before they can tag you, um, well, put your name on there, right? It has to be approved. So yeah, I get to go review. I must have like... 50 or so things I have to go review, but I don't approve them anyway, so I don't want my picture out there. Good to know. Yeah. Arif, are you on Facebook or are you the TikTok generation? Um, I feel like I'm stuck in between. I, I feel like too late, too, too late for TikTok and, you know, um, kind of phasing out of, of uh, Facebook as well. So I can't remember the last time I logged into Facebook. Everyone, I guess everyone I know, I guess Instagram is our place. Um, so I think so. Yeah, I think that's the happy medium between Facebook and TikTok. Yeah, is for sure. Instagram, it's which Instagram, is where really a lot of us are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. for sure. I I am I guess a consumer of TikTok at this point. Um, it's 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 hard to avoid, but definitely not like posting anything or creating content or showing off dance moves. So you're a watcher. Yeah, observing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, Glenn, if you meet up with RF today, that's your goal. Get him to dance at the Chili Cook off and then <laughs> post it on Get TikTok. That. Heck yeah. We're on RF. <laughs> oh, man. Walked into that one. In BYOVD or bring your own vulnerable, vulnerable driver news, Sophos discovered the Black Bite ransomware gang is using a vulnerable MSI afterburner driver to kill endpoint AV processes. So this seems to be an ongoing trend. This is the third vulnerable driver being used by these ransomware groups to kill the endpoint AV processes. Yeah, that's a weird one. I I, 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 I guess I'm still trying to understand is the driver unsigned and that's why it's they're able to expose that? I, I don't remember that one, Chris. Refresh my memory. Yeah. No, the driver's signed, which is what makes it dangerous. It's signed, so Microsoft will install it. There's just a vulnerability in the driver that allows itself. somebody to take it over. Yeah, it's a kernel-level driver. And then if you have kernel-level privilege, you can kill any process. That's and pretty that's bad. not good. Yeah. Yeah, it's really bad. For our opening topic, adult Happy Meals are now available at McDonald's. McDonald's has done yet another collaboration with a hip-hop group, this time the Cactus Plant Flea Market, to offer a 10-piece Chicken McNugget or a Big Mac in a super-sized Happy Meal box and one of four nostalgic toys, including Grimace and the Hamburglar. I know Brian's a health nut and hates McDonald's. I'll have to dig up that sound clip of him letting us know how he really feels. F McDonald's. RF, I know you're quite active as well with sports. Are you going to get this adult Happy Meal? I guess I missed the connection to sports. Well, you're, you're just very <laughs> active. You're very healthy. That usually he thinks he, he thinks you're a health. Oh, I, I thought it was a, you probably I thought it was a sport McDonald's. collaboration. Um, <laughs> McDonald's, man. I don't know. I can't remember the last time I had McDonald's myself. Um, I just I'm in Houston, man. Like our food scene is pretty good, so I more often than not, I'm trying something new, something more mom and pop. I don't necessarily find myself going to fast food a whole lot, and. The, Dude, last week for me, I got a happy, I got a kid's happy meal, small burger, fries, little toy inside. Love it, man! It's the Mater toy. That's perfect. Did Don't need the, it. Like I said, just need a snack. Just need a snack. Did you get the apple slices so. in the bottle of milk too. Uh, I didn't go with the apple slices. I went with the I went with the Sprite. <laughs> so they kind of looked at me kind of funny when I walked when I rolled through the drive through because it was like no kid inside the car. <laughs> I could have bring it home to a kid. Who are they to judge? It, it, exactly you're not my mom as brian would say would have been funny if i said if i got that with like a cup of coffee yeah (laughs) it would have been like uh what have y'all uh have y'all seen the mcdonald's sprite memes i have not it's like a whole thing about it how it it's just so strong like who what are they what are they putting in there is it battery acid like what's happening (laughs) that's interesting it's like a whole thing about it um is it stripping paint (laughs) (laughs) I know, like the there's the meme about the the ice cream machine is always broken. There, yeah, I think there's sure. actually a lawsuit for that, and then there's a, a Wall Street Journal article that says it's one company that makes these ice cream machines. It's it's sort of like Bugatti or McLaren, where 
if one breaks down, they have to fly a technician from headquarters oh, to wow. actually go out there and service it. And yeah, that's the whole ice cream machine broken thing is, I think is that's hilarious that it's become that a meme. That was one of itself. our podcasts. That was one of our podcast topics, I think. Was it? If I remember right. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I was halfway across yeah. the world once, um, just wanted to test it out. And sure enough, the machine was broken. Ice cream machine <laughs> was broken. <laughs> uh, uh, for sure. And I was like, I guess just those as, things are just consistent, huh? Just as reliable, just like Glenn's audio issues on this podcast. Uh-oh. Hey, be nice, man. <laughs> Come on. It's all in good fun and jest. So there's uh-huh. a certain nostalgia factor, especially at, at our age, like when the NES Classic, that that uh, little NES Nintendo system came out, it sold out instantly. You had games like Super Mario, the original one on it. Uh, Lego does a good job of capitalizing on this. I got the Super Mario Lego set, the set of the TV show Friends, and I even saw they made a Lego set of Seinfeld's apartment. And when Jurassic World came out, so this is the new... Uh, the new release that came out maybe five years ago or so, uh, Barbasol, Barbasol, the shaving cream company, came out with a special edition can of shaving cream that I, I just had to have it because if you remember the original Jurassic Park, that's how we smuggled the embryos. That was this this Barbasol can. Pretty cool. I saw that in in the Jurassic was it Jurassic World movie that that was just released. That was actually a, an homage. Lots of little homages there to the previous movies. Yeah, that was it. It was sort of like, you know, that movie Ready Player One, and that had, like, all the throwbacks to all the, like, Star Wars and Mario and everything. And, yeah. and that was, that movie received a lot of hate because it was, like, it was just so over the top. Like, they just tried to cram as many throwbacks as they, they could in that. I I felt like Jurassic Park was almost to that point. Like, the whole scene with the velociraptors and the sneaking out the embryos and the Barbasol can and... Not yeah. quite to the point of Ready Player One, but I, it was it was getting close. Like there's there's a fine balance between throwing it back or having it throw back or uh, just stuffing way too many over the top things in there. But that was the concept of Ready Player One was that it was always about all the games that everyone played, right? Inside of whatever whatever platform they played on, so that's why they chose you know the different uh, characters that they had within there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. I thought it was it was cool to see all that. Um, it, it did receive a lot of hate on that. I thought the hate might have been misplaced, but I only watched the movie. I didn't read the book. Maybe it was way worse in the book. Arf, did you check out Ready Player One? No, I I don't. Even um, yeah, I'm about to say something outrageous here, but I'm not even familiar with it at all. Okay, yeah. it's a. Uh, it's blasphemy, man. What's going I know, on? I know, I <laughs> know. Who are it's you? Reference a lot all the Who time, but I don't know. How long? Ago, how long ago was that movie been out? It's been out for at least five, six seven years. Years, now. maybe. All right, we'll, yeah, we'll set you up. Years? We'll we'll set you up. Yeah. All right. For our first next thing you're gonna tell, hold on. Well, the next thing you're gonna know is is he's gonna watch this movie. He goes, I don't get any of the characters inside of Ready Player One. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I did not want to expose myself <laughs> even further, but that's a that's a likely scenario, man. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're probably gonna look and you go, who the heck is? He's gonna come back and go, who the heck is Buckaroo Banzai? Oh. <laughs> See, look, look yeah. at his face. He's like, I'm I don't know like, who that you, is. What, what? Yeah, exactly. I was like, man, I don't want to dig into this because I'm going to I'm gonna out uh, myself for sure. That's it. That's all right. Not, you're going to have a test. We're going to have you back in two weeks. All right, I got to catch up on it. You're going to have to watch this movie. Yeah, you got to catch up. There you go. All right? No, it seems, I mean, it's referenced so often, though, that it's. I'm definitely missing out on, on uh, some big, a, a big staple of culture, I guess. Yeah. All right, for our first topic, this news has been making its rounds on InfoSec Twitter and has the community divided but not evenly split. Joe Sullivan, the former chief security officer of that ride-hailing app company, was found guilty of obstructing justice during the course of an investigation of a 2016 data breach. We will not rehash exactly what happened in detail, but... Basically, that app company suffered a data reach while Joe was the CSO. Instead of doing the right thing and disclosing the hack to the authorities or even his company's legal team, 
he personally responded to the hacker when the hacker reached out and attempted to buy his silence and even laundered payment to the hackers under the guise of a bug bounty program. Joe Sullivan's successful prosecution represents the first time that an individual executive has faced criminal prosecution for charges related to a data breach against the executive's company. Now, Joe Sullivan was not convicted because the data breach happened under his watch. He was convicted because he concealed a felony and was covering up a crime. After Joe paid the $100,000 to the hackers, he believed it was a security exercise and the company's data was safe because the hackers all signed an NDA. The government did not see it that way, and they successfully prosecuted Joe. The irony of this is that Joe Sullivan is a former federal prosecutor, so the very office he used to work for was the one prosecuting him, and I think that also led to the guilty verdict. As a former prosecutor, he of all people should know what he did was a crime. So, I, I, I'm a little lost, right, on this one as well. It's like, dude... Was he just trying to protect the Uber name or trying to protect himself in this situation from being discovered that it was on his watch that something like this happened? Because all he had to do was come clean and be transparent about the exposure, right? I think it's a little from column A and a little from column B that he wanted to protect the company. He might have had like a chunk of unvested shares that if news of this got out, it'd be disastrous for the stock price, which it was. Uh, or that he he was afraid it would tarnish his reputation that it happened under his watch. Yeah, I'm sorry, but no one's infallible, right? I think that's what we're learning today is no matter how good of a security program you have, you're going to have someone out there that's going to go, approve MFA because right. <laughs> I'm getting bombed, <laughs> right? Or, hey, what's your password? Oh, my password's one two three four five six. 456. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, no, you're always going to come down to the lowest common denominator there for sure. And it just seems like, I mean, you're going through some extreme lengths there just to kind of cover it up, right? Like it's, it's really, it's weird. Um, in today's day and age, like I understand if it happened on your watch and trying to protect yourself, but still like, that's just a bit, I think that's just a bit too extreme. Even yeah. if you're going to be terminated, like, so be it, right? What was the fine? Was the fine six months in jail in a nice, pretty jail, or is it like he's facing jail? eight years? He could get up to eight years. So this is—they're not joking. They're yeah. throwing the book at this guy. They're making an example of him. Yeah, it's not like he's going to Pelican Bay or anything like that. Right? He's going to—he's <laughs> going to Cush Jail, Club Fed, <laughs> Club Fed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see what his sentence is and and the fines that come with it. But it's definitely interesting. It this is very similar to what we see a lot in a lot of like insider trading uh, scams, like even Martha Stewart, like Martha Stewart did insider trading, but they didn't really get her on that. She went to jail because she obstructed justice, you know, lying to authorities and trying to conceal the crime. That's usually much worse than the actual crime. Like data breaches happen all the time. Like we talk about it all the time on the podcast and no one goes to jail for that. It's the fact that he took those extra steps to conceal it and actively try to, obstruct the investigation that's what landed him in the clink yeah come clean come clean brother i mean it's not worth it it also makes you wonder like i feel like a lot of these stories i mean this was kind of a a big headline type story but man like under the books like how frequently does this happen you know like how many people are trying to cover up breaches not disclosing it paying off ransomware attackers and just 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 bad practices overall right that that you don't even hear about and that's one of the things that's been floated on Capitol Hill here in the U.S. a couple of times, having mandatory disclosure rules that if you get breached, I think it's, I think now it's law. If you're like a federal contractor and you get ransomware, you have to report it within three days. But if they have that everywhere, like at least we'd be able to connect the dots, even right. if we can't stop it. We can connect the dots and see who the threat actors are out there. What are the common IOCs? What can we do better? And, and just warn people. Exactly. One more note on the legal front, Paige Thompson, the Capital One hacker, I can remove the word allegedly, she was found guilty and convicted, received no jail time. So Paige Thompson stole the information of over 100 million people and Capital One suffered losses of at least $270 million through settlements and government fines. Back in June, she was convicted of multiple crimes, but she will serve no jail time. 
a trial in December will determine how much restitution she has to pay to Capital One. So she could be working for the rest of her life and giving all that money back to Capital One. She pled a little bit of insanity on that one, right? If I'm not mistaken, when I was reading the article, it looked like she was uh, uh, unwell when, when she did that. That was one of her defenses. The other defense was she wanted to do it because she was angry. She never wanted to profit off of it. So the motivation was a little bit different versus some actor out there that wanted to sell this information. So all that contributed to the judge saying no jail time. Yeah, but it was what was odd was the fact that it was a cloud services company employee that serviced Capital One. So... What does that really tell you about your information that's sitting in the cloud service that's hosted by somebody else? Yeah, you got to really trust that cloud service and that cloud service vets their employees properly. Or that there are technical controls in place to prevent even a disgruntled worker from doing this. That's true. And that's how she was found out, right? Was they, they found that she was doing something outside of that? Was I can't remember. Yeah, it's, it's been she, a while since we talked about this. She did a server side request forgery attack, and there's not a lot of legitimate uses for that. So I think that started to raise some alarm bells. Like, why is there this SSRF happening? Capital One's environment. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Cool. Regardless, no jail time. That's kind of incredible in a way. <laughs> I think it was like she did time served so it wasn't like she didn't ever spend a day in jail i think it was the judge gave like time served supervised probation probably not going to be able to use computers or may as, as part of her uh parole agreement but yeah so no no additional jail time i guess would be more accurate two very different outcomes to two different trials yeah for our second topic, the U.S. NSA, our National Security Agency, is just the gift that keeps on giving. They released the top 20 vulnerabilities exploited by Chinese backed state actors since the year 2020. Now, that year 2020 is important, as you'll see later. We'll summarize their findings, but we'll link through to the full article in the show notes. The vast majority of the vulnerabilities exploited are remote code execution bugs. Starting from the top, and there's absolutely no surprise here, Log4J. So Log4J, Log4Shell exploit. Followed by Pulse Secure VPN, Atlassian Confluence, count them four Microsoft Exchange bugs. Citrix Say it ain't so. <laughs> right? <laughs> Citrix Application Delivery Controller VPN, F5 Big IP, Hikvision web servers, and for those who don't know, Hikvision is a IoT camera maker, uh, very cheap, made in China, and they're extremely vulnerable. I don't know why people are still buying these things, but yeah, they're out there and they're getting exploited left and right. Zoho mail service, Cisco Hyperflex, and closing out with VMware vCenter server. What's interesting is that there are multiple CVEs on this list that date back to 2019, so at least three years ago, and even more of them are dated 2021, so the patches have been out for over a year. This just goes to show that enterprises are abysmally slow at patching their systems. So is it because these CVEs have not been resolved that... By by these manufacturers that they're not having problems, or they there is a there is a patch, but companies are just not patching them appropriately. Well, I'll I'll flip the question back to you, Glenn. What is more likely that the vendor hasn't developed the patch, or that companies don't patch? Wow. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it goes back to the the last the last mile, right? The last mile is typically the the company and the employees associated with it. So shame on them. It's, so if you want to make sure Chinese backed state actors stay out of your systems, either patch or don't have these services or hide them behind a reverse proxy that's identity aware, which is at least for like things like Exchange and Atlassian, that's, that's one of the recommendations that you can severely mitigate these risks by putting them behind something else. Is this just, I guess, you know, go back to... Is this not understanding, not knowing, laziness? I mean, because that's, that's just culpability there, right? It's like, hey, 
there is a system. You've got to be able to patch these things. And I, you know, you talk, I talk to some of the customers that I've had, you know, in, in my pa- in the in in my life, and a lot of them are like, "Hey, we just don't have the resources." And it's like, "Well, then you go buy some application that'll help you just deploy." Then it's like, "Well, we need to test." I'm like, "Well, then that's why you have to have a sandbox environment where you can test that, right?" It's you you can't just keep running hot and just creating these new these um these uh, using these technologies and not being able to go back and test. But again, who the hell am I? I? I haven't run operations in over 20 years now. So I don't know how difficult that is. Yes, I was kind of thinking about that too. You know, resource constraint, like why why does this exist, right? Like why, like as you mentioned, laziness, resource issues or, or just processes just take long. Change management is slow at some organizations. But then Chris mentioned like 2019, so this has been out and about for a while. So at that point, I, I'm just like, how? How does that just slip up like that, right? It's already bad enough that you there's a new vulnerability out in a patch that you got to put in every week almost now, right? It, it's it's so ever evolving, and you really can't afford to be behind like that. But a couple of weeks, I can understand. A couple of months, maybe. But when you're getting into a couple of years, it just almost seems like. It, you just don't care for it like it's just yeah like you know you're wading into gross negligence territory at that point right. if you yeah. haven't patched a vpn box in three years like at some point it's it, yeah that seems to be gross negligence like you're you're actively trying to say <laughs> it, it like i heard this phrase like having your your pulse box out there with 2019 software is like the internet equivalent of a kick me sign so like you're just asking for it at that point yeah yeah I, you know, I used to be of the mind that I, I wouldn't, I'll, I, my phone, right? It's, you know, I, I used to be like, hell, you can't apply patches or, or you can't update the software on my phone until I say so. And then it got to a point where like every two months, three months, I see my Apple, my, my Apple store and it has like a hundred, a hundred applications that need to be updated along with the OS that needs to be updated as well. And I'm like, okay, I'm done managing this. I'm just going <laughs> to set it to auto update. And um, I, it's one less device that I want to worry about as far as receiving updates. Right. And so it's that one app that you need in a critical moment says, Oh, sorry, you've got to update before you can continue. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and not only that, but oh, by the way, this will only run on the latest code, <laughs> so yeah. on the latest uh, my uh, and when you're uh, connected iOS. to Wi-Fi, yep. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, okay, I'm done. Uh, let me not manage this before. I mean, I, and I, I'd like to say, Chris, and or I don't know if you guys ever run a a, a phone that was um, that was a uh, not sidecar, but you, you uh, the what, what's the term for it, Chris? When you when you run a different OS on there, like side load. Um, yeah, you sideload a different operating system. I used to do that all the time because I was looking for features. And then you realize, maybe this isn't a smart thing to do because <laughs> yeah, I'm like going to be running all kind of jacked up stuff jail on Jailbreaking or rooting it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was just not smart. So now I'm all about the latest, unless I've got my test laptop that I know that I'm just going to run, you know, try and run and break, right? So Isolated I don't know from you your feel. production network. Yeah, yeah. I don't know how you guys feel about, like, regulations and stuff. Um, but so my past experience, right. I come from energy industry. So colonial pipeline incident happened and overnight mandates came down and they came down hot and heavy. Right. Yeah. And one of them was seven day patching schedule. Now, you know, as an organization, we were already doing that, but it, I, you know, it's my opinion when, when you have things like, like those, like regulations that you need to be in compliant for. That's going to get the ball rolling for a lot of folks that might not be a priority for, right? But then it just gets into yeah. like, okay, well, you're critical infrastructure, so that's why there's some intervention from the government. But then are we going to start regulating like every mom and pop, small shop businesses? That Like, how do you right enforce that? Yeah, and I think that's probably why we don't have like a government-wide mandate or a nationwide mandate is, is exactly that reason. You have a mom and pop shop running outdated exchange they don't have a full-time it staff or even a full-time it person it's probably like a family friend that did it as a favor right. for them one time so it's like how do you how do you handle that i th- i think the i think there was like a resolution here in the u.s uh recently that said they're gonna fund the government's gonna fund some like 
money, some grants that you can have for cybersecurity best practices. So, I mean, I think that might be useful that these small businesses can apply for these grants to help shore up their cybersecurity. Uh, and then the other thing I was going to say is, you know, there is an alternative. If you don't want to keep patching your Microsoft Exchange boxes, you know, they have a cloud service you can use that's always updated and always patched. So there are alternatives to, to that. Well, I think that's it, right? I think that's that's the that's the tendency for everyone to go SaaS because you buy it, you use it, you consume it. Your your only concern is the data within the application, not necessarily having to update the services or the, the infrastructure that's behind it, right? That's what makes a Zscaler great because you don't have to do patch updates on a firewall or a proxy, which for me, when when I ran, you know, you know, voice and data you know, at my previous company, many companies ago, it was like, okay, what cycle did we do our testing? Okay, if you do the testing, you go one night and you upgrade all the, you know, 30 boxes throughout the whole environment, one of them fails, now you got to roll back. And it's like, it's just a weekend nightmare. Yeah, and that is to myself scrubs. is so worthwhile to not have to worry about anymore. Yeah. And that's why I'm in sales. <laughs> <laughs> Get ready. The book's coming out. We're going to be doing more content here. So Absolutely. for all you listeners out there, we're going to have the secrets to the success of being in a sales engineer. So, Yeah, I gave a talk in 2020. I actually vaguely or I intimately remember it where I, I pulled the data from that year's NSA report. And we're still seeing the same things like Pulsecure VPN, Search VPN, Microsoft Exchange, F5, Big IP. It just seems like CISA's call for companies to patch have fallen on deaf ears for at least the last three years uh, you know something's got to change yeah i think the other side of it too is like who knew that you had a router out there that was still accepting inter incoming ssh sessions or um uh, or or tell right? yeah that's what happened to to um t-mobile to t-mobile right yeah it's like what the heck like don't you guys have a team that's doing external testing of of your services that are that are external facing so it's like uh oh apparently so, not yeah <laughs> Maybe that's what we should do as a side hustle is like test. vulnerability scan the internet. Vulnerab yeah. Yeah. That's it. We could get in trouble for that though. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For our third topic, IBM did a survey of 1100 incident responders and asked them a range of questions. When I was reading the results and the takeaways of this survey, I realized you could actually swap out the role of incident responder and put in sales engineer in there and it would still apply. There are five takeaways, and I'm going to summarize them, but the full report will be linked in through the show notes. So number one, incident responders said that the sense of duty to help and protect others and the business was by far the most influential factor in attracting them to their profession. Number two is continuous opportunity to learn. And the last one would be a job root being rooted in problem solving. Number two takeaway. A sense of responsibility towards their team or client was ranked as the most stressful aspect of the job. Takeaway number three, 81% of incident responders think that the rise of ransomware has exacerbated the stress and psychological demands required to do their job. Number four, 67% of incident responders say they experience stress and anxiety in their daily lives as a result of their jobs. And number five, nearly 65% of cybersecurity incident responders have sought mental health assistance as a result of their job, and 84% say they have adequate access to mental health support and resources. So again, it's just swap out incident responder for sales engineer, and I think that still applies. Man, you make me see like you're, you're kicking in my PTSD there, Chris, because it's like, <laughs> holy cow. <laughs> for like, that is just like spot on. 100%. I was thinking of the same thing. So I was in an incident response role right before. And so everything, I mean, the server results, they're kind of spot on, man. Like, I, I would agree. Um, I found myself like working 24 seven, really, if the if the group chats popping off, you jump on, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's a call of call to duty, basically, that's how it felt. Um, and when yeah. there's no off switch, the stress can definitely build up. Yeah, it's like the Apollo 13 episode where they take a bag piled of whatever parts it is and they put it on the table and says, 
I need you to build a breathing apparatus out of this. And that's what you get hit with, right? As an incident responder, you're like, okay, this is what we know. Everything else we don't know, leave it on the table, go figure it out. And you're like, but this is, this is it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you gotta work with what I you start? got. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So, really? <laughs> so, and I feel like as SEs, that's pretty much what we get when we walk in. Imagine, imagine, um, um, Deech, when he walks into it as a solutions architect that's coming into a meeting and being told, you know, five minutes before he's got to present this whole topology of how things should work. And maybe he gets a, a nice information upload before the meeting, but a lot of times maybe he's just walking in there fresh eyes and, and he probably hasn't even met the customer yet, right? So that's got to be fun. So you're telling me I switched careers for no reason? There's no, there's no, there's no escape for me. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you, you, you know, different our, our kind of just, stress. No. Yeah, that's a different kind of stress. And I think for us, you know, for those of us that are in the sales engineering field, I think we do it because we like to challenge, right? And not only do we like to challenge, but it's a different type of challenge, right? So yeah. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I moved because I didn't want to do operations anymore. I moved because I wanted the challenge of doing implementations and, and talking about new technologies as opposed to just supporting them. Quite different, but yeah, but pretty close. Yeah, so some takeaways from the takeaways. Uh, incident response and SE life is not for everyone. Just like Ben Affleck in the recruiting speech that they made in Boiler Room, I similarly, I tell SE candidates that I interview that, like, look, this, this life is not for everyone. And if it's not for you, it's nothing to be ashamed of. It takes a special mindset and a personality to be able to handle the stress and anxiety that come with a pre-sales technical role. But if you think this is for you, you put in the effort, you will for sure experience the rewards. The other takeaway is you will pay for this job with your mental health, so make sure the salary attached to the job adequately compensates you for it. Well, I wasn't going to say that, but yeah, you know, so <laughs> if you're in this field, you're, you're kind of coin operated as well. So unless you're Chris, you just work for beans. So. <laughs> and work for the free coffee in the break room. That, that's right. That you don't get to go to anymore. So. <laughs> All right. For our last topic, it'll be a rotating topic every week. This week, I wanted to ask our guest, Arif, about his first job in sales. So as you mentioned, prior to joining us here at Zscale, you did not have enterprise software pre-sales experience. Uh, what are some of the things you've learned about pre-sales since you started that were not necessarily applicable on the customer side? Things about sales not applicable to the customer side. Um, really, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of it that actually translates one for one, but just in a different way. Um, I guess, let me explain that in a second. Um, so before you're, you're kind of solving solutions for your own house, right? You're, you're solving problems for your own house, but now yeah. you're kind of taking on other people's problems, right? So it's kind of a, it's like, it's a shift in that sense where it's different, but you're still problem solving, but it's, it's in a different way. You're applying it to your stakeholders are, are different. It's not in house, out of house, right? That, that example. Um, and aside from that, it's also, it's, it's surprisingly, it's, there's a lot of it. That's like a people aspect. So coming from like an enterprise role, it's all about tech, 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 like, you know, zeros and ones, but being in the sales role, it's, it's, it's also heavily dependent on the people aspect, the psychology of selling and just knowing your audience, being able to speak, like knowing your audience and being able to speak and tailor your message specifically to them. Um, there's a lot of that as opposed to where I was just thinking, you just got to know your tech, tech inside out and you're good to go. And I think that's a common disconnect too so like when we interview people or maybe i should be more specific when i interview people you can the candidate can know everything about the tech inside and out but if you can't talk to another fellow human being if you can't break down a complex issue and put it in lay people's terms you know that that's a huge miss that's a skill gap there because you could be the best solutions engineer out there and design these amazing systems but you you won't make it in sales unless you can you can talk to people Right. Yeah. No, that's for sure. Like it's exactly my focus was always been, you know, like, oh, I got to know the tool inside out, but it's also 
tailoring it, tailoring your pitch, um, and, and really breaking it down. That's no one buys anything because you have, oh, this feature X, Y, Z, and that's how it works. It's also like, how can you solve my problem? And being able to articulate that clearly. Yeah, it's like that old saying, people buy from people, people don't buy oh, from right, companies. Right, 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 yeah. That gets thrown around a lot, but I guess there's a reason why. <laughs> yeah. You know, you could have the best tech in the world, but it, if uh, the guy that's selling to you is a jerk, you know, or the engineer thinks he's smarter than everyone else, it's like, I just don't want to deal with that guy. And I, I saw that in, in when I was a customer was, yeah, like, that's awesome tech, but you're still an idiot and I don't want to talk to you and I don't <laughs> I don't want to do business with you, right? So, yeah. That's... Anything that surprises you from taking on this role now, Arif? Anything that surprises me? Um, honestly, I'm just eager at this point to, to actually. I feel like we have a really robust like onboarding process here. Yeah. But so I really have not jumped into the weeds of things. So that's why I'm like eager to jump in. What what it, what has surprised me though? So I came from a large enterprise, and that's the only like you know, that's the only place I've worked like full time. Uh, that's been my real gig. And so we had, you know, E5 license and all these, a lot of like good tech. And so I guess I was just a little naive into thinking that, oh, everyone has these things. Everyone has the latest and greatest. But one surprising thing, just, you know, talking to, especially in the commercial space, right? So I'm talking to uh, smaller organizations not everyone has there's a lot of organizations there that do not have adequate tools or security controls or just even thinking about things like that right so i just i was a little naive into thinking that oh everyone has all these amazing things but they really don't a lot of people have some really crappy technology that they're just making do with cool so we're going to have you back in two weeks, and then we're going to have you back in six months. At the six-month mark, you'll, you'll, you're going to tell us what you think of the last six months. Yeah. That's awesome. And in two weeks, is going to be the Ready Player Ready One. Ready Player quiz. One, yeah. So that's, that's right. Study up on that. <laughs> that's right. Well, this is amazing and great content for our SE book that we are definitely still writing. So we'll, we'll keep everyone up to date on the progress of that one. We continue to get great comments about our dad joke of the week. Dad joke of the week. This week, our guest Arif is up. All right, I got one for y'all. I'm a little, ner Make it I'm good. a little nervous because it's Make like it a good. religion at this point. <laughs> it's, it's... <laughs> Don't let our listeners down, Arif. <laughs> All right, George Clooney, Leo DiCaprio, and Matthew McConaughey get together to work on a movie. Clooney, Clooney says, "I'll direct." Leo says. I'll act. McConaughey says, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a, a good, good one. one. That was a good one. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Wow, that's good. Wow, wow. <laughs> there you go. All right, to wrap things up, adult Happy Meals are now available at McDonald's. Glenn still gets the kids' ones for some reason. That's right. It's right portion size, buddy. <laughs> No, J Joe Sullivan's conviction does not mean it's open season on CSOs and CISOs. Patch your systems. Sales engineering life can be difficult but rewarding. And for anyone wanting to get into pre-sales, communication is key. That's all I have for this week. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. You can find us all on LinkedIn. Links will be in the description. Follow us on Instagram at Pebcac Podcast. Thank you to all our listeners and subscribers who raised five stars in the iTunes store and Spotify and left us a review. We appreciate you all spreading the word to help grow the show. The best way to find us is to search for the Pepcac Podcast on your favorite podcast listening app. For our co-host, Glenn Medina, and our guest, Arif Sajid, I'm Chris Lou. Thanks for listening. We'll see you all next weekend. As always, have a nice day. Bye, Felicia. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day.